Welcome to Live Doff, your online Doff Yomi Shear. Shalom Aleichem and welcome back to today's Daf. Baba Metziah Mantes, we are holding 12 lines off the top of the Ahmed. We begin with a story involving Rav Kahana. Yahabuli Zuzia Kitna. Rav Kahana received partial payment for a kitna, a, a flax delivery. So a customer offered him part payment. And it turned out that before the customer paid in full, the price went up. Lasoif a yakir kitna. So Rav Kahana took partial payment, and then Iyakir Kitna, the uh, material went up in price. And Rav Kahana was contemplating canceling the deal, because it was not yet paid in full. Also, commit the Rav. He approaches Rav. Omar Lay, and Rav responds as follows. Partly. You committed partially for, for the amount that you have received payment. The Nikitas Zuzi, the amount of flax on which you have already received payment, Hablu, that you have to deliver at the original price. You can't change on that. Otherwise, you're exposing yourself to Misha Para, right? That Klala for a person who you know backs out on his words. So although technically the buyer had not yet acquired, had not yet done Mishicha on the merchandise, but he had paid for it. And that binds the seller to a certain extent. So that amount, that's done. Havlu, that you should give them. Vidach. But regarding the rest of the order, well, Dvar Minu, that's uh, at most just, you know, verbals, verbal commitment, and um, you could cancel that. Udvarim ein bahen amona. And with respect to verbal deals, there's no issue of lack of integrity. The itma, as we have learned, dvarim, if there was mere verbal commitment without actual payment, Rav Amar, don't worry about going back on that deal. Ain behen If there's any reason to back out, there's no issue of, of lack of lack of, of integrity. Rabbeich Amar, yes, there is. Yesh behen amona is considered lacking integrity. And this was Rav speaking to Rav Kahana, and he passed based on his personal opinion that. If it's merely dvarim, it's okay. Asks the Gemara Meisve. Here comes a kasha. Rabbi Yesi bar Yudah Eimer. Matam aloy mehin tzedek. The Pasuk tells you, keep your measurements accurate, honest. It says, Eifa tzedek, which is a huge measurement. Hin tzedek, which is a smaller measurement. It should be just, honest, accurate. And the question is, Valoy hin bechlal eifahaya. Hin is a smaller measure than an ephah. Once we mention ephah, then hin is included. It has to be accurate and real. Why repeat? Why mention hin after already mentioning ephah? Rashi says an ephah is 72 lug, and a hin is only 12 lug. El Olam will to teach you like this. We have a drasha. That just as you maintain accurate, honest weights and measurements, you're meant to keep your word as well. We learn hin as hain. When you say yes, it's yes. When you say no, it's no. When you commit, it's binding. Yes is a yes, no is a no. Bottom line. A person is meant to feel bound by his words. How could Rav just allow him to back out from a verbal commitment? It's very different. Here, there, there was reason. It, it went up in price. He, he was going to lose his profit. But there, in, in the price, it was speaking about when you express your words, it should be genuine. That's all we're saying. At the time of verbalization, those words should be real. Amr Abayahu, when the Pasuk says, Hain shachat tzedek, Allah shachat tzedek, Shalayidaber echad bepeh, vechad one must be careful not to you know, be saying one thing and be thinking something else. But otherwise, if, if at the time he was real, he was genuine, there's no issue there. Even if later on he has to uh, cancel due to you know new circumstances that have arisen. Mace, here comes another question. Zav. So when you swap a talus for a dinner zav, the opinion on the talus, which is the object, versus the dinner, which is the currency, the 
kinin on the object completes the deal. Ve'en dinar zahav kinin talas, but the kinin on the dinar zahav, which is considered the, the currency aspect of this equation, does not affect the talas. Mikal makam kahalachas, although that's the way it is. Aval amru, but nevertheless, if a person backs out in the middle of a deal, Misha para, right? Mancha dara mabal, mancha dara flogo, who also li para, misha inoyim amid bidivurai, he backs out, he's in trouble. And the Brysa continues there, we had this yesterday, that if there was no actual payment or kinyan, just a verbal, you know, commitment, then he's not even liable to Misha para, rather, we hold it against him somewhat. The lotion we used yesterday was, Ein ruach chachamim noichahimenu. Chachamim are not pleased with his actions. So, so bottom line is, even verbals carry consequences. Even dvarim are considered mechusari amana. If you just back out, you're lacking integrity. Tanoi, actually it's machlekes tanoi. It's not maisa. Rabbi Yechonon ben Masno, ben Masyo. He turned to his son, Shomer Levnoi, he'd say, go out to Scherlo Nepoyalam, go hire some workers for us. Halach uposak lemezoynus. Not only did he hire the workers, but he actually stipulated to them that he will provide their lunch. But he didn't, he didn't um, specify what was on the menu. He left it in the dark. So when it comes to his father, his father raised the red flag. Hold it. When he returned to his father, his father, when, upon hearing what he did and what he said, and what he committed to, he said, My dear son, You know, if you don't go back and quickly explain to them and stipulate what's on the menu, even if you're going to provide the most royal, exquisite, gourmet meal like Shlomo Melech in his time of glory, you're not going to fulfill your duty, you're not going to have fulfilled your obligation. They're always entitled to more because they're princes. We're talking about Jewish laborers. They're the children of the Avais. They're entitled to the biggest and the best, the nicest meals. So quickly go back and clarify things before they drag you uh, uh, into bankruptcy. Rather, before they start working, before the, wor- the you know the work commences, save Emerlem. Go explain to them. It's true, I'll provide you lunch, but just a sandwich, uh, on condition you, you won't have any claim on me except for you know bare minimum. Ella pass for kittens without bread and beans. Now we have a cash on the story. The fact is, he had already committed to them, and if. Verbal commitment is binding. How could the father instruct him to go back and back off on the deal? He already committed. Well, Shani Hasim, there it's very different. The Payalm go five because the workers themselves, like some they never really, really felt a commitment. My time, you know why? Because he was just a, an agent of the father. Made the Yadi, they know full and well, Dalavo Samach. He's relying on his father, and they know that, you know, he can't really promise more than he can do. Asks the Gemara Yachi. So if that's their mindset, they're not really taking it seriously. So why do you have to rush back and catch them before they started working? Even after they began working, the commitment is not really set in stone because they themselves know that it's not committal. Answers the Gemara, no. Once they begin work, it's a fait accompli. They're saying mechdas amru. They figure meimer amar kamei above and he Certainly, the son went back to the father. He presented the conditions of employment, and he was okay with it. And he accepted it. The fact that is, he allowed us to begin. So, catch them before they begin working, and then you could undo it. So we had figured the Gemara thought that we found a source that that even. Um, that uh, dvarim are not binding uh, from the fact that he was able to change the menu, but ultimately we gave a different reason. It was attributed to the fact that they themselves did not feel that uh, as a commitment, not take it as a commitment. Asks the Gemara, you, you know, earlier we said that according to Rabbi Yechnan, even dvarim, even a verbal commitment has to be adhered to. Umi Amar Hachi, is that so? That according to Rabbi Yechnan, you back out from a verbal commitment, it's considered mechusar amana, lacking in integrity. Reuben turns to Shimon. You know what? I have a gift waiting for you. He can go back on that. So first, 
we're focusing on the words. Yochel, he could, meaning halachically, there's nothing stopping him. Well, pshita, obviously, I mean, he didn't do a Kenyan. What do you mean, Yochel? Of course he could. Elamut halachsavoy, we mean to say that he's allowed to. There's no issues. It's not lacking in integrity. And this is who's speaking? This is Rabbi Yechon who's speaking. Amra Papa, it depends how much you're promising. Here we're speaking about a large gift. There it's not done until it's done. And therefore, being chayzer is not an issue. When Rabbi Yechonah says that um, you should not be chayzer from a, 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 a verbal commitment, that's where it's a relatively minor amount. And, you know, the recipient sort of looks at it as a, a done deal. So there you should not disappoint him and go back on your words. I'll even prove that this distinction between, you know, the various amounts, it's a true distinction. Once again, we quote Rabbi Yechon. We have a Yisrael, a farmer, turns to a Levi. I'm engaged in the, in the master process, and actually, I like you. I want to give you the master rishon, which amounts to a very large amount, a kur. It's sitting by me in the silo. I'm designating it for you. I'm marking it for you. Ben Levi, so now the Levi can be so assured that he's actually going to get that. Rashayla, soy soy trumas master amakim achar. He can actually proceed and use that. For Truma's master, for some other maceration that he has elsewhere, from which he's required to separate a tenth called Truma's master and give it to the coin, he can rely on the maceration that was promised to him by the farmer, which is sitting in the farmer's possession, and use it as Truma's master for his own maceration. Now, this is all good and well if the farmer cannot renege on his promise. So that assures the lady that he's getting it. That's why he can proceed and use it as his Trumas Master Fund. But on the other hand, if in fact a farmer, after promising, can just cancel that promise. Am I Rashai? So how could the Levi risk using that promised Master Rishan for his Trumas Master? It can turn out a big mistake because if the Yisrael goes back on his promise. It, it never goes to the Levi, and the, the whole procedure is null and void, and the Levi had eaten Tevel because he relied on that first from his master. So, what do we see from here? We see that Rabbi Echelon is speaking, telling us this halacha, and the, the Israel cannot be chazer. And Rashi explains that this is a matanamu etes. <laughs> it's called a minor gift. You know why? Although it's a huge amount, it's a core. But in terms of what the Israel is giving up, it's only it's a very little thing because it, it, remember, the Masarishan doesn't really belong to the farmer. He's meant to give it to the lady. What does he have in it? What interest does he have in it? What Ownership, so to speak, does he have? What stake does he have? It's called Tevas Hanna. He has some sort of residual benefit because he can choose the recipient. He has that sort of, you know, favor, you know, benefit. He's going to be, he's going to be uh, uh, feeling that, 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 that appreciation and, and reciprocation or whatever that's going to bring, right? So it's called, it's called Matana Moetas. He has a minor stake in this, in this core. And since he promised it to the Levi, he has to adhere to his promise. As per our distinction, and according to Rabbi Yechanan, by Matan Mo'etes, you're committed. Well, says the Gemara, who says? Hach Ma'eskinan, perhaps was speaking, Shanat Loi Mimeno. First, the Levi already, he took possession of the Maserish, the Chazar of Kide and he gave it back to the Yisrael to, uh, to watch for him. So, perhaps there was more than just a commitment, more than just Varim. He actually took possession of the Masoretian. Yeah, if that's the case, the Levi actually acquired it. Amos Seifa, let's move on to the next part of the Allah. Nosnil bin Levi Acher. Let's say the farmer switched plans. He promised it to uh, this Levi, then he decided to give it to a different Levi. 
That's it. Aimloy Elo of Elatanoim. It's the first slave you can be very upset and have complaints, but that's it. Because the, the Yisrael changed his mind. One second. But if we're speaking like, like you're suggesting, Levi already took possession of this maceration. So when the Israel switched recipients, Levi can do nothing but complain. What do you mean? It's his. Given the Mashkei, Mamoina, it's the Gabe. Once they did Mashiach, the Levi did, it's his. It's his moment, it's his possession. Ela lav Shema, Mino, but not lav Shema, Mino. Clearly, we're speaking that he did not do Mashiach. It was merely promised to him by the Israel, and since it's Matan Mo'etes, he's expected to stick to his words. So, in summary, we had a story with Rav Kahana, who took partial payment for a shipment of Kitna. It, it, it went up in price. He wanted to uh, he contemplate, you know, canceling the deal. Rav says, you can on the rest, but not on the portion that was paid for. Over there, you're going to be running into a Mishapara. But regarding the rest, Rav holds, Dvarim, Eimbahem, Shemuchasur Amona. There's no issue. Contra Beichnan. By Dvarim, there is Muchasur Amona. But the more concluded that specifically by a Matan Mo'etes, there you have to stick to your words. How Gavra? Do you have Zuzi? Asumsumi. So there was another fellow who um, purchased shumshumi, uh, sesame seeds. She paid for them without actually physically acquiring them. It turns out that the shumshumi went up in price before he had a chance to take possession. Hajabu, the sellers, backed out on the deal. Formerly they told him, sorry, we, uh, we ran out of sesame today, less than shumshumi. Here, pick up your money, take back your money. He failed to pick up his money. Ignoi, it turns out the money was stolen before he got a chance to get it. So who's responsible? Asulka made the rubber. It came to rubber. Amrle, he says, look, Mr. Uh, Buyer, you were told to pick up your money. Kivan the Amrlecha, Shkozuzach. They told you to pick up your money. Bully Shaklis, you failed to do so. They're off the hook. They're not responsible. They didn't commit themselves to watch your money. Loy me it goes without saying, Shemir Sachad Lehavi, that they're not considered Shemir Sachar. Certainly, they're not getting paid to watch the money. They're not even considered shemechinam. They don't even have the most minimum level of responsibility towards your money. Only Rabban the Rava. So Rabban asked Rava, "Hold it. The seller is exposing himself to a mishapara because he had been paid for the items, and now he's backing out. Who said he's going to choose to go down that road? Maybe." Once he gets wind, he's made aware of the fact that he's exposing himself to Mishapar, he might decide to stick to the deal. In which case, the money is considered his. So why do you say he's totally not responsible for that money? Armor al he says, you're right. Hachinami is true. It's up to him. If he decides that he wants to proceed, of course he's responsible. Um, but otherwise, he's not uh, responsible. Armor a puppy. Right, so Rashi explains, so basically, either he, he delivers the Shum Shemim or he gets the Mishapara. I mean, yeah, it is up to him. Amra Papi. Rav Papi had a different version of this whole story. And he had a reliable source to tell him that. Amra Li Ravina. Ravina told me that what? Lididi Amra Li. Ravina is speaking now. This certain Chacham had, had relayed to me and what was that Chacham's name? Rav Tavus Shmei. Some say his name was Rav Shmuel Bar Zutr Shmei. And he was a very honest, a man of integrity. Even if somebody would offer him Kol Chol Dalma, the whole world, the whole wide world, he would never lie. He wouldn't deviate from the truth. And this Chacham, this honest man, he was the subject of this story. The story occurred with me. And the story actually took place a bit differently than our earlier version. Hava, so it was a certain day, Apanyo de Mali Shabbat Hava. It was Erev Shabbos towards evening. Havi Sivna, I was sitting in my house. Vasa Ogavra, this fellow shows up. Vukoy Abba, he's standing by the doorway. Amrli asks me, Yislach Shem Shemil, do you have some sesame to sell for, for the chalas? Amrli, I told him, sorry, I'm out of, uh, I'm out of stock. Amrli, he says, you know, could you do me a favor? 
You see, I'm holding the money, I'm running to the shul. It's getting dark. Please, would you, would you mind holding on to my money? I'm really, so I said, look, uh, look, my house is here. You know, do as you please. The fellow put the money in the house. It got stolen. I never really took responsibility. I offered my house. I also look at the rubber. So he comes to the rabbi. Amalei says, you're right. Kolcha beisa kamach. Whenever you say such an expression, you just have, my house is yours. It means, it means what it means. Lo'em b'boi Hashem yasochad lehavi. Needless to say that he's not Hashem yasochad. Al afilu Hashem echidna lehavi. He's not Hashem echidna. He's not responsible. Afilu Hashem echidna lehavi. So there was no deal. There was no going back on deals. Chas v'shol. Just a straightforward story. An offer to buy. He was out of stock. Etc. Amrulay, so the Chachamim. Amrulay, so I asked, Rapapa speaking. Rapapa saying, look, uh, I heard another version from Ravina regarding a whole different type of story. So I turned to Ravina and I said to him like this Amrulay, Boko, Amrulay, Rabbanan, Larova. Remember, according to the first version, there was a whole back and forth. Rabbanan asked Rava, how could you absolve him of uh, responsibility? What happened to the Mishapara commitment? Right? That, all, that sounds like there was some sort of reneging on a deal. <laughs> he sat with the Mishapara, but, right? So how can you say? And, and Ravina told me, look, according to my version, it never happened. <laughs> no, there was no back and forth with Rava because, as we said, there was never a commitment, there was never a sale, there was never a, a, anything like that. Okay, Rabbi Shim Oimer Kol Shakesa Piyodai Yoda Al Yoyna. So back to our Mishnah, back in the beginning of Azov. Payment does not uh, close a deal. Meshich on the item does. Until that happens, according to Tanakam, everybody can change their minds. According to Rabbi Shimon, Kol Shakesa Biyodai, Yoda Al Yaina, which sounds like only the seller, the fellow who actually took payment, he can change his mind if he sees a need to do so, if the price goes up, whatever, but not the buyer. And according to one Explanation: the, the point was that the Chachamim hold that you know this whole Mashiach requirement is only to protect the interests of the buyer in case a fire breaks out, so the seller should feel committed. It's giving him an incentive to protect the uh, the, the grain of the buyer still sitting in the seller's storeroom. Uh, what's the incentive? Look, if the price goes up, you can go back on the deal and earn more profit. So he has an interest in protecting those items. And likewise, allowing the Lekeach, the buyer, to change his mind, will do the same, because when he sees the fire raging, he'll change his mind, he'll just cancel the deal. So that gives the Meicher incentive to protect the items. Reb Shema says, no, we don't need to go that far, as long as the Meicher has that ability, that's enough. Tanya. Here comes another, uh, Bryce, another instance where Reb Shimon holds, you cannot be chazer, you cannot cancel a deal, after money had been paid. Amar Rabbi Shimon, Masai, when is there a halacha that you can be chayzer after payment? Bizman sha kesef ba piris biad moicher. When the, both the money and the piris are sitting in the hands of the seller. Al kesef biad moicher, u piris biad like keach. But if the money is already in the hands of the seller and the piris in the hands of the buyer, enu yach lachzva, he cannot, he cannot change his mind. Rabbi Shimon, kesef biad, because the money is in his hands. In whose hands? In the buyer's hands? Biad biad moicher. I thought it's in the seller's hands. Typically, money is in the seller's hands. He paid for it, right? Oh, he meant the items received in exchange for the money. The kaspa is biyad is already in the hands of the of lekeach. Hold it. If it's in the hands of lekeach, then of course it's a done deal. He did mashicha. There's nothing to talk about pshita. Amar Rava, Hachav, my skin was speaking about a unique case. The Lekeach paid for the uh, grain. Where's the grain sitting? The seller had rented the Lekeach's, uh, you know, warehouse. So, technically, the grain is sitting in close proximity to the Lekeach. But, halakhically, it's still in possession of the seller because it's sitting in the, in the rental Rented to the seller, to the meicher. We're speaking at the upper floor. It's an example of the lekeach's premises were rented out to the 
moicher to the seller, to the dealer. Moiskeres biad moicher. So you have a situation where the lekech is sitting in his house, and the grain that he purchased is sitting on the next floor, but technically it's in the hands of the, it's in possession of the, of the dealer, because that area, that, those premises were rented to the, to, the, to the dealer. But Moshiach was not yet done. It's sitting in the rishos of the moicher. And here, Rav Shimon says, you should know this is an exception to the rule. Typically, Chazor is allowed, but here not. Why? Time or might? Because the whole rationale behind Chazor is to protect the Lekech's interests, right? So the Moichar has an incentive to protect it from fire, which is not really relevant in this case because Lekech is sitting right there. If there's any trouble, he'll save his items. Time or might? Kin Rabban Mashiach. Why did Rabban make a Takana for Mashiach? Basically, until Mashiach, it's not a done deal. Like we said, right? Because there's a concern that the Meicher might not have the, the uh, incentive, not, might not be spurred to go and protect the Lekech's property. But here it doesn't apply. There's no concern. Here it's sitting in the Lekech's property. If there's an accidental fire, he'll take care of his uh, grain. He'll <laughs> So, there's no reason to make Chazorah. How God would do the story of a fellow Diyoyev Zuzi Achamra. He paid for a shipment of wine. So, if it turns out, Shema that he hears, the Kaboy Le Mincevay, the Parzak Rafila. It's about to be taken to Mr. Parzak, who was a uh, Mishnah Mach vice president. They're going to expropriate the wine. He had paid for it already, but not done Mashiach yet. Amr Le Havli Zuzi. So this uh, customer turns to the dealer, can I have my money back? I have no need for the wine. <laughs> can he do that? He comes to Rav Chiz and he says, yeah. He says, just as a Chachamim, allow a Meicher to renege if you know, the price goes up. The same privilege, the same ability was given to the Lekeach. He can cancel the deal until he does Mashiach. Because he the Mishnah regarding the topic of Oyna. One is not allowed to cheat during Mecca Chamemka, during business transactions. So it goes both ways. The Meicher, the seller, should be careful not to overcharge, not to cheat his customer. And the buyer as well should not be cheating the seller by underpaying for an item. Now, there are three levels to Oyna. If the discrepancy between the real value and the charged value is less than a sixth of the total, then it's presumed to be, you know, part of the deal, you're Michael. And there's no claim, there's no, you know, claim on that. If it's more than a sixth, cancels the deal. Bitul Mekach. If it's exactly a sixth, the deal stands, but you have to, you know, pay that back, you have to compensate for that. For that amount. We'll see that in the, in the Gemara, in the Sugya, a lot, a lot of details. But in a nutshell, that's the, the formula to work with. The sixth is what, you know, triggers the, the, the Aino. It says the Mishnah, Aino Arbo Okesaf. What constitutes Aino? Four coins out of 24. Me'eshem Arbo Sela. The Rashi explains it. You have a Sela, which contains four dinar. A dinar contains six mois. So a seller has 24 mois. If you cheated him by, with four, you overcharge, you undercharge, four kesef out of 24, that's called a no. You have cheated him. So the halach of a no kicks in because it's a sixth of the deal. So you buy something. You realize that you were overcharged. How, how long do you have? How much time do you have to come back and complain? There must be some sort of, you know, time limit. Yeah, enough time to allow the customer to show it to some sort of uh, dealer that he trusts who will give him an honest evaluation or a relative, right? Issued the following psak in the city of Lud. And Rashi says there they had uh, real... Uh, Sharp businessmen who would uh, try to overcharge <laughs> and make, uh, make uh, the most they could. So he increased the Aino. Instead of merely a sixth, he said until an eighth, 
It's not an issue. Hoyno shmoyno kesef. Sorry, he said uh, until a third, a third, which allows them to earn more. Shmoyno kesef. It's eight kesef, me'esrim ba'abo kesef, out of 24, the sella. So basically, a sella is 24, and if you have cheated him by, uh, by, by eight, which is a third, shlush lamekach, a third, you're in trouble. So he gave them a, a, a you know, bigger leeway, and they're very excited. The Samachot Hagar the dealers in Lod, are very uh, overjoyed. Omar Lamberti says, hold it. There's a downside too. There is a string attached. Instead of limiting the, um, the, uh, the refund you know, time, as we said before, to allow him to show his relative, that's a very small, short amount of time, he expanded that. The customer has all day to come back and complain. Amrullah they said, no, no, no. We're giving up on the privilege and we're giving up on the, on the, uh, uh, the expanded, you know, refund period. Let, 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 him, let us stay where we are. So they were... Uh, they were pleased with their old system, like the Chachamim, which uh, gives them a smaller margin of profit. Right, a sixth is already a no, but it limits the um, the zman of chazora, which makes it less probable that they'll uh, be caught in time. So now, when we speak about a sixth being the threshold for a no, how do we define a sixth? You can learn it two ways: either a sixth of the the value of the item that you purchased, or a sixth of the total deal, the total amount paid. So which one is it? Machleg is Rav and Shmuel. Itma. A sixth denotes a sixth of the value of the item. Meaning, let's say the item was worth six dollars and you only charged five. Right? So that's a shtus. Right? So the, uh, the meicher um, um, was cheated. If he overcharged, he went from six to seven. So now the, like, yeah, the customer overpaid by a sixth. According to Rav, it's about the item's value. Shmuel Amar, that's one way to look at it. Shmuel Amar, there's another aspect as well. Shtus mois nami shaninu. You can work one of two ways: either a sixth of the of the value of the item, or a sixth of the total amount paid. That's also called a no. And the Gemara explains. So in the next two cases, it's pretty clear. There's no machlekes. All agree that it kicks in. Let's say the item was worth six. Shavishita. But Hamisha only charged five. Which is six less. So whether it's Rav or Shmuel, they both agree there is a no. The seller was cheated. Or Shavishita Bashiva. Alternatively, it was a six dollar item for which he paid seven. Here the buyer lost a sixth. Kuliyama Le Pligi, the boss of Mecca all agree. He focused on the Items value, but no have you, and certainly the dinner of no applies. There's no machlekes. Keep pleading. Machlekes applies in the following case. Shavi chamisha b'shit was worth five dollars. He overcharged. He went up to six. So now let's think. According to Shmuel, he overcharged him a sixth of the total payment. Ultimately, he paid him six. And one of that was the Aino, the cheat, the cheat part. Right? So that's a regular Aino. But according to Rav, it's more than a sixth. If you focus on the item's value, which was merely five, going from five to six is more than a sixth discrepancy. So here it's more than a sixth. And now it takes you to the next level. Bitul Mekach. We learned before that if it's more than a sixth, the whole deal gets canceled. So depending on your perspective, depending on what you're focusing on, Hence the ramifications. And likewise, in the next case, Vishavi Shiva Bishita. Here we have the seller being cheated. He took an item worth seven, mistakenly sold it for six. So, what happens? According to Shmuel, the discrepancy was one coin. Ultimately, he paid him six. So, one out of six is a no. According to Rav, it's less than a sixth, because 
in terms of total item value, which was seven, one out of seven is less than a sixth. So it's mechila. And the more explains. The Shmuel, according to Shmuel's opinion, the Amar Basam Mois Azlinan, who also focuses on the percentage of the total paid amount, either be the Oinah Havi. So the last two cases, both are Oinah. It's exactly a sixth. The Rav, the Amar Basam Mekach Azlinan, according to Rav, it's a sixth of the item's value. So it's a totally different ballgame. Shavi Chamisha Beshita, when it was an item worth five, sold for six. So if you look at the item's value, which was five, the added six, the added six dollars really more than a six of five. So the whole deal gets canceled. Whereas in the second case, Shavi Shiva Beshita, when it was a seven dollar item sold for six, with the sellers losing, but he undercharged them by one dollar. One out of seven is less than a sixth. Mechila havi. It has dinam mechila. With Shmuel, my Shmuel responds, no. It's all the same thing. It's aina. Either factor triggers aina, whether it's a sixth of the item's value or a sixth of the total amount. Either way, it works. Kiyamina mechila ubitul mekach. When do we say less than a sixth is negligible and just, you know, Falls by the wayside, or more than the six is bitol mekach cancels the deal. Hey, chad alekosh tus mishnei tzadim. But there's no element of a six, nothing. Not as per the item's value, not as per total paid. Avol hey chad alekosh tus mitzad echad. I know have you, but if there's any element of shtus, any anything, either or, either a sixth of the item's value or a sixth of the total paid, that constitutes a no. Okay, so again. The classic case of Ainoa pertains to a sixth, whether overcharged or undercharged, right? According to Rab, it's a sixth of the item's value. According to Shmuel, either item's value, either that, or a sixth of the total paid amount. So now, let's go back to our mission and see how it fits with, you know, Rab and Shmuel. Ha'inoa dalt kesef, me'esrim barbo kesef l'asel, So Ainoa is four out of twenty-four. And the Mishnah calls it a sixth, right? Shtus Lamech. My love, the Zavn Shavi Esrim Bar Esrim Barbo. We're assuming that he purchased an item worth 20, Shavi Esrim, and he paid for a 24. So the Lekeach overpaid. By how much? By four. But what percentage is four out of, out of 24? A sixth. That's only because you're looking at the total amount paid. This is a right to Shmuel. Okay, so it's four Since four is a sixth out of the total amount that was paid, which was 24, that constitutes a no. It doesn't work like Rav. According to Rav, we have to look at the item's value, which is merely 20. And four of 20 is more than six, a fifth. Lo, he says, well, no, the Zavin Shavi Esrim, Bob Esrim, the other way around. The item was worth 24, and he only paid 20 for it. Minas Anamarcha, and the seller is the one who got cheated here. And this certainly is a shtus, even according to Rav, because the item was worth 24. He was cheated an amount of, of 4, which was a 6 of 24. Okay, fine, let's assume that's the Pshana mission. Let's uh, consider that. But the thing is, let's continue. Amos safe. Mission continues. Amotai Admosai Mutalachse. How long do we wait for the uh, fellow to realize the mistake? Give him enough time to show, show it around. That's only true. A customer has that time frame. But the seller, if he was cheated, his time is not limited. There's no uh, deadline there. The more later will explain the reason for this. So clearly, the mission which sets forth this limited Chazara time frame, is speaking about who? Who was cheated? The Lekech was cheated. So you can't suggest that the mission speak about the Meichar being cheated. Ella, rather, the Zavin, Shavi, Esrim, Barbo, Esrim, Etzmanyo. Oh. So rather, like this, we'll try to reconcile the Mishnah according to Rav by switching the numbers again. What the Mishnah meant was that he took an item which was worth 24 and he bought it at 28. He overpaid by four coins. But four 
of 24, which was the value, original, real, genuine, real value of the item, is a sixth. And that works according to Rav's walk, the sixth of the item. So the Mishnah can work either like Rav or, or like Shmuel, depending how we learn the Mishnah. Tanan, let's move on to the next part of the Mishnah. We're going to have the same back and forth. Hoider, instead of speaking about a sixth, Rav made it into a third, but it's going to be the same sort of back and forth. Hoider, Rav Tafim, Beloid, Hoinosh, Mine Kesef, Me'esim, Rabbo, Kesef, Lasel, Shlishlamekha. He changed it from a sixth to a third. I know is eight coins, eight out of 24, which is a third. Again, what what happened here? How much was the item worth? How much was it sold for? My love was speaking to Zavin Shavishit, Rav Tafim, Rabbo. He purchased an item which was really worth 16 for 24. He overpaid by a third. And clearly, when we speak about percentages, we're speaking about percentage of the total amount paid. Because the item was really worth only 16, and he overpaid by 8. So calling it a third, evidently, is related to the total amount paid. That's right to Shmuel. No, that's not what happened. The Zavan Shavi Esrimba Bob Shitsa. The other way. The seller was the one who uh, was short ended. He sold an item worth 24 for 16. Minus Anna Meicher. The Meicher got the I know. He was cheated. And uh, 8 is a third of the uh, of the actual value, which is, uh, which is uh, I know, like Rav too. Okay, so the Meicher is in trouble. Aim of Seifel. Let's move on to the next part of the Mishnah, which indicates that the Lekech is the one who's suffering. Amr Lemr, call you So uh, he said you can, you know, come back all day and, and, and complain. Amr of Nachman, Shona, it's only true of the Lekech, but the customer of a Meicher, the Meicher has forever. So clearly, we're not speaking about the Meicher being cheated. The Mishnah is speaking about the Lekech. Ella, rather, we got to go like this. The Zav and Shavi Chavdal plus him a train. The item was worth 24, and he bought it for 32. He overpaid by 8. But 8 is really a third of the item's actual value, which was 24. So it fits with Rav as well. Tani Kaveh said to Shmuel, we're going to have a right from a price at the Shmuel, that the, um, the, the Eino is, can be measured vis-a-vis the total amount that was paid as well. Tanakav said, We have a seller and a buyer. So the, whichever one of these two parties who was cheated, he has the upper hand. And this is actually going with another sheet, or Bida Nasi, who says that when you were cheated or overpaid, uh, underpaid or overpaid a sixth, then you have a choice. You have two options on hand. Either you can demand that, you know, that money back or you can cancel a deal. That's his sheet. Yodal Yon, Ketzat, for instance, Machalei Shavah Hei Bevav. So the seller went up in price. He overcharged. An item worth five, he charged the sixth. Who lost on the deal? Who was cheated? Minas Anah Lekech. And, stop for a second. We're considering this, I know, because there was a, a, a sixth discrepancy. Now, why is it only a sixth? <laughs> The item was worth five, and he charged him an extra dollar. That's more than six. The answer is we're going like Shmuel. Total paid amount was six, one of which was the cheat amount. They know that's a six. A constitutes they know it's right to Shmuel. So bottom line is Yad Lekechal Yonah. The customer has the upper hand. He can choose his options. Rotsa, if he wishes, I remember I say can ask for that discrepancy back. I tell him he take the full money back, cancel the deal. I or Nisani, refund me the you know the difference. Let's say he sold him an item worth six and he only took five for it. Minus Anna Meicher, who lost on the deal, the Meicher, Yad Meichel Yain, the Meicher has the upper hand, he can choose his options. What's the Emilatin Mikhi? Oitain Limashi Nisani, he can either ask for his item back or the uh, the cheated amount. Okay, so uh, in today's daf we learned about Rav Kahana's story with the flax. He was uh, advised by Rav to stick to part of the deal, the part that he was paid for, otherwise he's susceptible to the Misha Parah curse. Regarding the rest, Rav Paskin, he can just go back on that. There's no issue of integrity. Rabbi Yechon disagrees, at least when it comes to a matanamu etes. Uh, your word is your honor, you have to stick to it. We have the story about the uh, fellow who officially sold the, uh, committed to the uh, sesame deal. We have two versions of that story. We have Rav Shimon's halacha about cases where you cannot renege on a deal even before Mashiach. Now we proceeded to the sugi of Aino, 
which is typically rega- uh, pertaining to a sixth, a discrepancy of a sixth, it can go both ways. It, it can be uh, an overcharge, it can be an undercharge. So, um, how to define a sixth? The Machlekes Rabbi Shmuel, and continue with Hashem tomorrow. All the best to you, Atzlochu